Good morning, church. We're opening this new year of 2022 as we have in recent years with three weeks of prayer and fasting as a church. And I hope that you will participate in some way. Not only is it good spiritual discipline, but there is a release of spiritual power from heaven when we fast. And that can be enormously important for us as a church family as we move forward in this coming year. Jesus considered that fasting would be a normal part of the life of his disciples, as his instructions to them in Matthew 6 indicate. I've highlighted a couple things for you there on the screen. Jesus says, when you fast, as he's speaking to them, not if you fast. But the New Testament doesn't record that he gave them specific directions on how to fast. Now, he may have done so privately, but what we see in Scripture and in the history of the church indicates that he left matters fairly open as to how and when and how often his followers ought to fast. So there are a whole lot of ways you could participate in these three weeks of prayer and fasting. Let me begin today with a few important reminders. First of all, fasting refers to going without food. Abstaining from television or forms of social media or other kinds of entertainment may certainly be valuable, but they are not a substitute for actual fasting. But secondly, fasting can take a number of different forms. There are many ways to fast, and all of them can be valuable and meaningful and powerful. An absolute or a a total fast would be going without food and any liquids, including water. Now, this should never be done for more than a day or two, and only if you're in excellent health. A normal fast would be going without food but not water for some period of time, for a portion of a day or one or more days. Or a partial fast would be going without certain foods, such as meats or sweets, for a number of days. So what could fasting look like for us during these three weeks? Well, you might fast for one meal, or for one meal for several days, or one meal for every day of the three weeks. You might fast during the daylight hours and have one meal after sundown for a single day, or for several days, or for all 21 days. You might choose to fast by abstaining from certain foods that you normally enjoy for one day or for one week or for the entire three weeks. Or you might only eat certain foods uh, during the three weeks. Perhaps you might fast for one entire day or one day every week or for three days in a row or every fourth day or every other day. Or you could fast the, the entire three weeks. Maybe you just try intermittent fasting where you only eat during an eight to 10 hour window each day. There isn't a wrong way to do it. (laughs) It's really up to you. But number three, I encourage you, follow the Holy Spirit's leading and wisdom from trusted counselors, including your physician, and common sense when fasting. So if you've never fasted before, start with something simple like fasting a single meal, or perhaps a single day, or maybe trying a partial fast from certain foods. Going without Meats and sweets, for instance, can be both both manageable and healthful. It's often called the Daniel fast. The prophet Daniel did that for a three-week period. And if you have medical issues such as diabetes or hypoglycemia, anorexia, or low weight, uh, be sure to consult your physician before attempting to fast and follow his or her directions if you're cleared to fast. If you'd like any other additional information about fasting, you're welcome to send me questions or to give me a call. I'd be happy to share more with you. But more important than how we fast is why we fast and why we would do so as a church. On both a personal and a corporate level, fasting is an important spiritual discipline. For one thing, it's a helpful reminder that we are not prisoners of our appetites. Our desires do not rule us. Jesus does. And fasting, especially regular fasting, helps us keep that in mind. It's also a helpful reminder that God gave us good gifts, including good food and taste buds. Right? He didn't have to do that. And one of the great lessons I've learned from fasting in my life is that eating is a really good thing. You know, and I'm actually being serious here. I know it sounds like something that Captain Obvious would say, you know, of course, eating is good. But maybe it is an obvious truth, but it's something that can get very twisted in our minds, particularly in a culture for we have such abundance. Christian faith is not opposed to pleasure. Following Jesus does not require the elimination of all pleasure from one's life. But there have been times in the history of the church 
or in the life of a single person where we've fallen prey to this twisted idea Godliness <clears throat> looks like anorexia, but it doesn't. On the other hand, neither does it look like gluttony, which is more often our particular sin in the U.S., something that fasting can actually help us to conquer. But fasting is still a good reminder that pleasure is neither the goal of my life, nor is it a necessary good. I can live without pleasure. I can deny myself the pleasure of eating, something that God considers good for us, but I can do that for a period of time in order to accomplish a higher a spiritual goal. <clears throat> Fasting also helps me put aside ordinary concerns like buying groceries or figuring out menus or preparing meals, saving leftovers. It allows me to pay attention to spiritual concerns that I might otherwise ignore or dismiss. Spiritual concerns that are actually of great importance but which can easily be masked by the screeching demands of my life, including those loud noises from my stomach and the even louder noises from the inner I want center of my, who I am. <clears throat> the truth is, there are some lessons from God that can only be learned by tuning out the noise of my cravings and my desire for food. There are some spiritual truths and some spiritual realities that can only be perceived by eliminating for a time what is ordinarily a very good habit, that is, eating food. Again, let me be clear. There's nothing bad or unspiritual about eating. But the, those ordinary and very mundane and very necessary tasks and routines of preparing and eating food can mask the voice of the Spirit of God. And because it's easy in our culture to live as slaves to our appetites, listening to the constant barrage of enticements to eat more and to eat more often and to eat this, our spiritual sensitivity can become dulled, unable to recognize the voice of the Spirit of God. But fasting helps clean up the noise so we can hear more clearly. Think about the audio specialist on the criminal forensics show who eliminates certain frequencies from the recording that the detectives got and so now they can hear the person's voice that is hidden behind this wall of background sound. Or just imagine something simpler. Imagine clearing off the clutter on your desk and finding the beautiful wood that's underneath those piles of papers. Right? Fasting kind of helps us clear away the things in our minds and in our habits that are hindering us from hearing God. And so as individuals and as a church, there's a great value in setting apart a special focus time in order to bow our hearts, humble ourselves before God. We lay aside our rights, as it were. We, we lay aside our right to feed ourselves in order to put God's purposes before our needs. And we choose to intentionally withdraw from our everyday ordinary concerns in order to give God more attention more fully, more consciously, more consistently. And that in itself is a powerful spiritual weapon, one that can have a dynamic effect on us and for those for whom we are praying. There is, however, another side to this equation. It's another critical piece of the puzzle that we really have to understand. Fasting is an act of worship. But like every other aspect of our worship, it must be connected to the rest of our ordinary life in order to have any effectiveness. The prophet Isaiah, to whom we've been listening over the past month in preparation for Christmas, spoke very pointedly about this very matter. From Isaiah 58, <clears throat> he says these words, Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking one another with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? 
Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. God's point, spoken through Isaiah, is pretty straightforward. Fasting is not just a religious exercise. There are no points with God you can score by doing it, as if God is going to be impressed by your willingness to be hungry for a while. Fasting is only spiritually effective when it's connected to the rest of your life, and in the rest of your life you are actively carrying out God's commands and advancing His kingdom. So think about it. Why do we fast? We fast in order to help us hear from God. Why do we want to hear from God? In order to know what to do. So we bow our hearts, we pause from eating in order to position ourselves to hear what God would have us do. And then we rise and do what God has said to do. Without the rising and doing, the bowing and the listening don't accomplish anything. Now, some people are all about action. They're very strongly task-oriented. They love projects. If you don't give them a project, they'll come up with one all on their own. They see a problem, they dive in, they don't stop till it's done. And the world is a better place because of people like this. Our church is a better place because we have people who are like this. But action people can make a mess of things or cause more problems if they don't consult with others, especially with whoever's in charge. Uh, and especially if they're the, you know, shoot, ready, aim sort of people. For instance, imagine a guy. He comes home from work early, notices, hmm, my wife's gone. But on the kitchen counter, he sees a recipe for blueberry pancakes, sees a skillet, some flour and eggs, no sugar, no blueberries. He thinks, no problem, I can fix this. I'll be a blessing to my wife, I'll get dinner ready. He grabs his favorite camp griddle, proceeds to whip up some amazing pancakes. Now there's no blueberries, so he skips all of that. Substitutes some applesauce for the sugar, throws in some bacon because, I mean, well, bacon. And then he adds a side of sausages and voila, dinner is set. Then his wife comes home with their two daughters. Each of the girls is carrying a brand new apron and a carton of fresh picked blueberries. And mom has five pounds of sugar and a new strainer. And dad says, ta-da, dinner is ready. And his wife gives him that look. I promised the girls I would teach them how to make blueberry pancakes. We've been planning this for a week. And she points to the calendar with the date circled and marked pick berries, pancakes with girls. Shoot, ready, aim. See, Mr. Get-It-Done Action Man has just ruined his wife's carefully prepared plan for a special time with her daughters. He saw what he thought was a problem, solved it in his mind, but failed to consider that he didn't have all the information he needed. He was ready, as usual, to rise up and do something, but he hadn't bowed down and listened yet. On the other hand, we've got people who are thinkers and all love to play with ideas, to mull things over for weeks on end or years on end, consider and reconsider every possible permutation of potential outcomes. They're extremely helpful when it comes to planning and policy making, and the world and our church is better when we have this kind of people involved. But thinkers can be slow to act, and sometimes they spend so much time reconsidering things that all of the momentum needed for that particular project is lost and it goes on top of the pile marked good ideas we never got around to doing. Or they want to pray about this decision just one more time. Or they have great ideas but they're really not willing to get their hands dirty to actually get the job done. 
Or perhaps they simply want to talk about things and keep talking about things, and pretty soon they become the critics who are quick to find fault with every possible solution, quick to complain about how the project turned out, quick to criticize the efforts of those who tried to do something. They're happy to bow down, not so interested in rising up. And in both cases, we've got people who are potentially crucial for the success of the church, people whose input and help are vital and necessary for the work that needs to get done, and in both cases, they're missing a crucial element of the process that God has given to us for spiritually effective living. Think about the familiar story we read again this morning of the coming of the Magi. The Magi are a great example of bowing down and rising up. They bowed down when they were studying the Hebrew scriptures and the positions of the stars in the skies, seeking to hear from God. They spent their lives attending to both the word of God and the natural sciences, so that when this new star emerged in the sky, they were prepared and able to recognize the sign from God. But they didn't just make notes about this new star's position in the sky. They didn't just say, well, isn't that interesting? and continue on with their studies. No, they rose up. They changed their focus from studying to action. They made preparations for a lengthy journey. They selected their gifts. They set out on a quest that took perhaps as much as two years to find the newborn king. And their example is so telling for us because they did both parts of the process. They bowed down, and then they rose up. They prayed. They listened to God, for God, listening for God's direction, and then they acted. We see a similar thing in Paul's letter to the Philippian church. In chapter 2, Paul is addressing a problem within the church. There's disunity among the believers. There are several key individuals who are particularly responsible for making things worse because of their self-serving attitudes. And Paul's answer is twofold, and it involves bowing down and rising up. He begins by explaining what it is that ought to be their goal, that they ought to be people whose personal lives and whose life together demonstrate what it means to know Jesus because they are characterized by humility and self-sacrificing love. Then comes the bowing down part. Paul lays out for them the picture of what that humility and self-sacrificing love actually looked like in the person of Jesus. And he calls the church to consider the example of Jesus, to ponder what it meant for him to divest himself of the privileges of deity in order to serve and save human beings. Verses 5 to 11 of chapter 2 actually form one of the church's oldest hymns, one that the Philippians may have already known and used in their corporate worship. And Paul wants them to prayerfully and deeply reflect on this description of Christ to ingest it, as it were, and its truth. He wants the model of Christ clearly in their minds as the template for everything in their relationships with one another. Then he switches gears quite sharply and directly. He says, work out your salvation, he tells them. He doesn't say work to earn your salvation. He doesn't say work to prove that you deserve salvation. Paul's not suggesting that salvation is something that can be obtained through religious duty or through hard work or through being good. What he means is put into practice the things you say you believe. Make your faith real. Make it concrete by living according to what your Christian faith teaches. And in the specific context of the Philippian church, therefore, Paul is telling them, especially these problem makers, he says, in your life, in your daily affairs with one another, you need to adopt a mindset of being humble and selfless. The model, the pattern that they have to keep in mind is that of Jesus Christ. That's the bowing down part. But then, in addition to acknowledging him as the model, they're supposed to actually imitate his life in their own daily affairs with one another. They're to live selflessly, making sure that they honor others above themselves and considering how they might meet the needs that others in the church have. That's what it means to work out their salvation. To make sure that what they have acknowledged in their faith is taking root and growing fruit that's actually visible. That's the rising up part. And so it is for us as well. Not only in this season of prayer and fasting, but throughout our lives as 
individual followers of Jesus Christ and as a congregation of those who have committed to following him together. And when Paul mentions that Jesus Christ is the one with all authority, whose name is above every other name, that's not simply a throwaway bit of liturgy. It is to Jesus that every knee will eventually bow. And everyone will have to acknowledge the greatness of what he has done and who he is as the rightful Lord of all creation. But we who know him must be the first to bow down. We're the ones who acknowledge him as Lord and God now, so we bow in prayer to hear what he would say to us. We pray and fast in order to know what he's asking us to do. And we listen so that we can carry out his commands. And then we rise and we work it out. We follow his instructions in how we live so that God's will becomes apparent in us. It appears to others. It takes on concrete, visible form in the patterns and the choices of what we do. We put his instructions into practice, and so we see the kingdom grow in us. And others can see that and know who Jesus is. So as we start 2022... Let's set our hearts to hear from God and to do what he says. Let's make sure that we're bowing down, that we're consciously putting ourselves in a position to hear from God through fasting, with prayer, with humbled hearts. And let's make sure that we're rising up, that we're connecting our praying and our fasting with our everyday lives by doing what we hear God tell us to do so that our lives reflect his goodness, his love, his truth, his presence to people who don't even know there's a God out there until they see you and see him in you. 